The presentation you are about to see deals with something that is both very sensitive and very serious. Of course, all of us would hope that we would always be well and that all our family members would be healthy. But we know that illness happens and accidents happen when you least expect it. What you are about to see from Rabonim and medical personnel is the concept of being prepared when the unexpected happens. Please listen carefully and take what they say very seriously because you never know when it can apply to you or to your family. One of my favorite psukim in all of Tehillim is Ani Omarti Bishalvi Bal Emot Liolam. We all think that everything is fine and dandy now and nothing can ever happen to me. Um, Bal Emot Liolam, I'm never going to be shaken. Uh, the unfortunate, sad, tragic truth is that there's no such thing. Uh, each one of us at any moment uh, is vulnerable to all sorts of chas v'sholem, all sorts of uh, terrible things. My own mother. My own mother was killed in a car accident. She was 41 years old. Uh, we had a real issue with uh, autopsy. Perhaps if uh, there would have been some directives, <laughs> some written directives, perhaps it, may, it would have made a difference. I don't exactly know, but we certainly were unprepared for that. And at one point, Rahman al Islam and the yeshiva of our size, we had over 20 Yisraelim in the yeshiva. I had to deal with over 10 widows and 10 broken sets of grandparents, and everybody has their own ideas what has to be done. The biggest bracha that one can do is plan for the future. It is essential that we be responsible. The main principle in medical ethics 2012, and this has been that way for a number of years now, is a principle of autonomy. And autonomy is a fact that the patient themselves is the sole arbiter of what is ethical for them and what they want done. Because oftentimes at the end of life, uh, situations the patient, him or herself, is unable to participate in the decision process. How do we prepare ourselves? Because in some situations, hospitals are not so prudent, or the patient situation is not so clear, or the medical prognosis is not necessarily unanimous. And the answer to that is a writing signed by the patient that designates someone to make decisions for him or herself in those situations when they cannot make a decision for themselves. To leave instructions uh, for emergency medical treatment, for end of life issues, uh, for instructions about uh, burial, uh, about not wanting an autopsy, uh, these kinds of issues. Whatever can be discussed before the situation arises is always going to be to the benefit of the patient and the family. The decisions are difficult ones when to continue treatment, when to not continue treatment, and very often you'll find there is strife caused within the family when they can't agree on what to do, on whom to consult, and how to proceed. It's not a subject that most of us want to deal with. So, if we don't deal with it at a young age, we're very likely at an old age we're also not going to deal with it. So we might as well confront it at a time when it's less threatening. If these things aren't taken care of, there are problems, and if they are taken care of, so you do it once and it just, you know, you put it away and you know it's done. Personally, when my sister was ill, which goes back now five years, the hospital felt that they're running the show because there was no advanced directive, so they wanted to do what they thought was right. The physicians are sometimes at a loss uh, what to do because uh, there are different options which could be offered the patient. And this is a grave problem for patients without advanced directives. And having a better sense of what the patient, him or herself, would want can also alleviate some of the anxiety that the family is experiencing. One example, um, and it's horrible, I mean, you can't even imagine this, but um, 
uh, I dealt with a situation where there was a Holocaust survivor who unintentionally was cremated because she didn't have the right forms. She survived the Holocaust and yet here she is being cremated because she didn't have one form. In 1967, you had the first right to die case, Karen Ann Quinlan. After a very long and very public court case, it was front page of all the newspapers nationally, it was decided that she could be removed from the, the ventilator which happened. So she was removed from the ventilator, and what was found was she really didn't need the ventilator. So she ended up living for about 10 years. And very often the doctors in the hospitals are pushing in a certain direction, not only because, or not just because they want to fill the bed, but because there's a feeling out there in the world that uh, life is defined by its quality. And if you can no longer contribute to society, if you can no longer live the way you're accustomed to living, then your life is not really worthwhile, and therefore it should be ended and make way for someone else. Well, the Torah doesn't believe in that. The Torah believes that quality of life is determined by how a person can worship HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us a gift. It's the gift of life, and we have to protect that gift in every way we possibly can. It's not ours, it's His. There is a misnomer, very interesting, has a rephrasing. There is a usual, usual common phrase is, as long as there's life, there's hope. Which basically means to say is, if there's life, there's hope, and as you can do something to prolong that life. From a Toyota standpoint, the phrase should be changed. As long as there's life, there's life. Life is important for the sake of life itself. There may not be hope at the end of the tunnel. But the very fact he's living now, the very fact he's living another five minutes, another ten minutes, another hour, another two, another three, as long as there's life, there's life. When it comes to the end, so the children are always left with this question. The parents are not in a position to make a decision which way to go. They're not fully conscious. They're not aware of what's going on. And then the children are always going to feel guilty. They don't know how to proceed. So that, that, that's, the most, that's the most common shyla these days, is end of life shyla. The children, religious children. They ask each other, what are we supposed to do? Should we extend life? Should we just uh, let the parent die and so on? There are certain situations that demand every possible medical measure to be done. There are other situations that demand, no, it's time to let go and let, uh, let the Rebona Shlolem make the decision, so to speak. But there are halakhic guidelines to this, and they're very complex. They call for, really, a posek, a halakhic authority, um, who's truly an authority. The basic fundamental guidelines is we don't do anything, that's everybody, we don't do anything actively to hasten, to hasten the end of one's life that we cannot do. But sometimes there are allowances in halacha, which that is, which is basically being passive. Being passive, certain treatments may be withheld. And that depends exactly which type of treatments may or may not be withheld. But that's the top task of Shiloh when asks his Rav and his Rabbi to find out exactly you know, what guidelines to follow. The person who fills out such a card should discuss with the Rabbi and Vince what his feelings are so the Rabbi will know what, what he wants. The least that we can do and the least that a hostile hospital ethics committee or unsympathetic or disinterested or overworked judge can expect of us is for us to pick up a pen and sign. If we won't take that step, can we expect somebody else to listen to our arguments later when a lawyer gets a call at one in the morning to do this? So I ask you, do what you can. All of these forms are so simple. There is no real information other than the names of the people you're naming as a proxy and as a rov, their phone numbers, their contact information, their phone numbers and address, and so on. And all of that information is the same on every single one of these forms, whether it's the card or the healthcare proxy or the living will or the uh, U.S. living will registry. To leave that open for the family to decide or for some unqualified rabbi to decide or for some emergency room physician to decide is really not being responsible and is not doing what's halakhically appropriate. The real big advantage of the MS card is that it is with the person in a place where it will be found. It attaches to the license. And it's very clear, it's very succinct, it's right to the point. 
It makes it clear, number one, that the person had a living will, that the person designated a healthcare proxy, that the person designated a um, rav, a rabbi, to make those decisions, and that they are opposed to autopsy and to cremation. Having this card signed, explicit, in our pocket, at all times, chas v'shalom, anything happens, we're prepared and our families are prepared. So it's a very, very simple process and the rewards, chas v'shalom, in the case of need, are really enormous. After watching this presentation, I'm sure you feel as I do, that it is so important for all of us to carry this MS card with us at all times, to make sure that in case chas v'shalom, the unexpected happens, that things will be done to us and to our family members only in accordance with halacha and accordance with our wishes. We thank Rabbi Zona, the NASCO organization, for making us aware of this important project.